that uh, that our first uh, Zoom seminar, our first seminar of the whole academic year is Professor Sergei Artemov from City of University of New York Graduate Center. Uh, so Professor Artemov is actually a distinguished lecturer, distinguished professor there, and his his uh, fields of research include um, all aspects of, of logic and computer science and philosophy and mathematics, many areas that are that are um, in all of these things. So I know him especially for. Um, well, for all of his work in proof theory and his, all of his work in justification logics, uh, since I, I, I had previously worked on a, a competitor approach that he completely demolished in uh, epistemic logic. And, and, uh, and so, and now I, th I feel like um, one of the highest compliments that you could give to somebody in, in logic is that they're an iconoclast because to, to, um, to smash the idols of our own misunderstanding uh, is, is really one of the highest things that we could say, you know, when we're doing a kind of fundamental subject like logic. And what, it, what attracted me to his talk today is exactly doing this, is that he's taking something that we thought we understood, uh, the incompleteness theorem, and, and, in, and we thought we, we had an intuitive way to talk about it, and showing us that actually what we thought was is wrong. And so to me, that's a very, uh, like a tour de force for anybody to do. So without further ado, I, I I give you uh, Professor Artemov. Oh, uh, Larry, you're, you're very kind, probably too kind, but psychologically it's not that easy because most of, most of the time when you enter the area, you befriend people there and they're close, real, real, friend, real friends there. And sometimes they're not happy. That's when, when something pops up which, which, uh, which is, goes uh, contrary to their expectations and to what people invested in. And uh, this is this is not easy, and for me as well. But the truth is what we try to discover, and uh, that's good. So or, I need to, yeah to make you the host, I think. Or can you share your screen? You can, uh, the only thing you can you have to do is to 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 allow me to share my screen. Let me try to share right, mine. So how do you try try it? Because I didn't do anything. So try to. Yeah, I think you should be able to. So go ahead. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So yes. it's all yep. yours. Yeah. Absolutely. And is it the correct name in the Analogic Seminar? Because I, I couldn't find a better better name for this. Yeah, the University Logic Seminar. Yeah, this is it. That's good yeah. Indiana, yeah. not state, but the university, yes. Indiana University Logic Seminar. Yeah, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. I'm just dragging a little bit because I, I feel that people people will, will, kind of, will, will keep coming. And well, maybe you, you could tell a story of how you came to do this work. So, so uh, how, did you, how did you come to think about this? Very good. This is um, just behind me. Uh, there is a nice, nice looking book. Yeah, there's a nice looking book. And uh, this is the, the Cambridge Tracks in Mathematics, Cambridge University Press. And it's basically what you said. Uh, it's a, a logic of proofs and justification logic um, written nicely uh, under the pressure of Cambridge University Press. And uh, as, as, you, as, you, as, uh, as you, of course, know, uh, when you systematize things, you have to feel a lot of in-betweens uh, of the highlights there. And one of the in-betweens there was to, to, uh, to explore the BHK semantics uh, what, um, uh, for uh, intrinsic logic. And uh, in particular, it's Kreisel's so-called second clause. It's a well-known effect. Uh, I, it, it, it deserves a separate lecture, so I have to scramble a little bit. But uh, it shows that the, the classical clauses of the BHK, Brower, Hutting, Kolmogorov semantics, constructive the proof semantics for intrinsic logic, should be um, uh, um, should be <clears throat> upgraded, and in particular the, the clause for implication should be supplemented with the selector, with the, with the verification function, which shows that what you do, uh, then the corresponding, the corresponding mapping from the proof of anti-setting to the proof of succeeding actually does the job. And if you have, don't have this proof, uh, the, the verification, outside verification, then all kinds of strange things happen. In particular, there's a famous negation, um, 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 the unsatisfactory solution of negation problem for realizability. Uh, it's also the, the engineers know this well, and then uh, when I try to uh, end, uh, but if you take this path through S4 and the logic of proofs, then 
you have to put the box, which is a Gedalian box in front of the uh, already you know, in front of the application. It gives you automatically when you realize it. It gives you a verification, and then I just uh, then I begin thinking of what kind of what kind of mileage can we get for the classical proof theory about this, and um, after two or three steps and some mirages, which I just of course tried to chase. Uh, for a short while, I ended up with realizing that what we're doing is actually uh, trying to be constructive, uh, the constructive reading of classical proof theory. And this is a short story. I'm, I'm checking whether, yes. Okay, uh, did, did you kill enough time for this? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, please start. Sure. And, uh, how many people do we have here? Uh, 31. Or how many participants are there? This is 31, it's fine. This is 31, okay, good. No, I just... Oh. Yes. So, uh, the... Um, as we all hear, this, uh, back in 1920s, Hilbert outlined a program of establishing consistency of formal theories uh, by trusted finitary means. And uh, I remember talking with, to my mentor, Andrei Nikolaevich Kolmogorov, about this program, and it was very, he issued very inspiring comments. But the popular wisdom says that Hilbert's, uh, Kolmogorov, of course, built in the 20s in Göttingen, so he knew everything firsthand. So a popular wisdom says that Hilbert's program was blocked by Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, which we'll call G2 for short, uh, back in 1931. Uh, and uh, just a short reminder in the base case of the first order piano arithmetic PA, which we'll mostly be uh, considering today, but not exclusively, but mostly. G2 states that some arithmetical formula, COM PA, which can be interpreted as an internalized consistency assertion is not derivable in PA. Of course, given PA is consistent, but also we need another input, which is the uh, formalization principle. Any contentional reasoning within the postulates of PA can be internalized as a formal derivation in PA. And the justification for this one is probably is rooted somewhere in the first air in Gödel completeness theory, which shows that all the reasonable way, uh, all the ways of reasoning, the classical reasoning, can be uh, embedded or shaped as the formal reasoning <coughs> in uh, the first order logic uh, with the corresponding language, of course. And together, formalization principle, and I'm repeating the, the quick root, quick proof of uh, this impossibility reading. So, uh, formalization principle together with impossibility. Uh, uh, of formal proof of com PA suggests that PA consistency cannot be established by means of PA. And this is a popular wisdom and <clears throat> which is probably concentrated in, uh, I looked around for a nice summary and the Encyclopedia Britannica as usual comes, uh, comes with a real suggested help. So it gives a very, very precise formulation. There exists no, well, very convenient for my for my uh, purposes. There exists no consistency proof of a system that can be formalized in the system itself. <clears throat> and uh, this this is this is really what we uh, we show to be just plain wrong. And uh, there uh, there will be no uh, tricks. So that not we're we're not canceling the um, the weakening role in logic. Or we're not trying to do some impossible cryptic worlds and uh, exploiting worlds or something, or to do uh, or to drop uh, some of the arithmetical principles. No, no, we try to be foundationally completely honest and we try to take the problem uh, at, at, the, at its first face value. And uh, so, in in, uh, in this respect, we're moving in the opposite direction to um, uh, several generations of our predecessors actually do. We don't try to, to, to get around uh, uh, G2, 
about uh, around the second and completing the theorem and trying by by weakening some of its conditions we really try to tackle the problem as is and we'll see what happens but uh, um, as a historical observation neither hilbert nor Gödel really accepted this conclusion the, 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 this the so-called popular wisdom uh, Hilbert, in his uh, foundation of Grundlage and Mathematik 34, rejected the impossibility reading of G2 uh, in the context of proving consistency. The view that certain recent results of Gödel show that my proof theory can be carried out uh, from context, it was clear what he, that he was talking about. Uh, his, his consistency program has been shown to be erroneous. The fact that result uh, in fact, this re that result shows only that one must exploit the finitary standpoint in a sharper way for the further uh, reaching consistency proof. <clears throat> Remarkably, Gödel himself, he challenged the uh, formalization principle. In, nowhere, uh, in his original G2 paper, not less than that, on formally undecidable propositions of 31, Gödel writes, it is conceivable that there exist finitary proofs that cannot be expressed in the formalism of our basic system. We can read it as the formalism of piano and things. There are reliable indications, well, some, some history, historian and philosopher of mathematics say, well, it was later on he, um, he really deviated from this position. But there are reliable indications that late Gödel remained skeptic with respect to the impossibility reading of G2. And in particular, uh, uh, Gerald Sachs recalled Gödel saying in, to him person, in person in 1961-62 that some type of revival of Hilbert consistency program would eventually become feasible. And I quote from Sachs, Gödel didn't think the objectives of Hilbert consistency program were erased by the incompleteness theorem and Gödel believed it left Hilbert's program very much alive and even more interesting <clears throat> than it initially was. And the source for this is all, almighty internet. It's the, the video of Gerald Sachs lecture, Reflections on Gödel, uh, and uh, here's this, the, this, the pointer of 2007. And it's still available on, U on YouTube. There are several links to this. And uh, I thank Dan Villard for pointing out uh, to this quote for me. So this talk has three sections. First, preliminary, we argue that Hilbert and Gödel were right in rejecting the impossibility reading of G2 and the popular wisdom, quote unquote, is not well founded. Uh, the second will be pure mathematical. We provide a direct mathematical proof of consistency of PA by means formalizable in PA. Namely, uh, just I'm, I'm removing one one smoke screen immediately. So how does it go? For any given PA derivation S, which is a finite sequence of formals, we find a PA definable invariant I of S and establish an arithmetic that for each five in this particular S, I of S, I of phi holds. And I of S of zero equals one doesn't hold, and zero equals one does not occur in S. The people from proof theory would immediately recognize that it's something, uh, something what um, uh, very nice complexity crowd uh, led by Pavel Pudlak and also with uh, Jan Krajicek and Sam Bas were doing in studying the complexity of the corresponding proofs and uh, studying proofs in weak arithmetics. And uh, what I'm doing here technically this is a small, rather small technical fragment of what they're doing, but arranged uh, and, uh, uh, in a different way. And of course, with some additions, which show that it does the job actually, which we claim it should. Uh, and the third one is foundational. And this, this one, uh, we explain how these findings fit into the existing foundational picture and outline a general theory of proving properties presented by schemes of formulas rather than formulas themselves. Note that even at this moment, when uh, there's in bold uh, the, the general scheme, the general idea of how we prove the consistency or prove that uh, any, any given derivation S 
doesn't contain zero equals one. And this is exactly what uh, the original Hilbert's definition of con consistency. Uh, G2, Gödel theorem, prohibits having such invariant I uniformly for all derivations S, but it doesn't rule out the possibility of having the invariant I of S for each S. But for mathematics, it's all right. It's totally, totally okay if you want to prove something for a given N. You take N and you build a construction, which of course depends, eventually depend on this N, but in some regular way, uh, you, you build a construction which yields the proof that N obeys the property which you want to. So there is nothing unusual, nothing tricky, no, uh, nothing secret and nothing new mathematically in this way of reasoning. <clears throat> Hilbert's notion of consistency, once I mentioned it, the goal of Hilbert's consistency program was to give Hindry proofs of uh, the, that there can be no derivation of contradiction. For Hilbert, the domain of number theory are numerals, strokes one, two, three, four, and so on. And the finitary general proposition is a hypothetical judgment that comes to assert something when a numeral is given. So Hilbert was careful about formulating general propositions. It's not, it's not like I'm saying uh, all by one sentences are here, but it's something that, uh, mm, well, it says that it's hypothetical judgment comes to assert something, a numeral is given. For us, it's, um, uh, it's a moral support, not that we're trying to implement what given designed, uh, Hilbert designed at the moment, but it's, an, uh, it's a moral support to what we're doing. We, we, we prove something when a numeral is given. In general, for a logician, if you reason in arithmetic, there are two major ways to prove the universal statement and something holds for all natural numbers. Uh, the most obvious one is you do it by induction. You prove 5, 0, and then 5x implies 5x plus 1, and then you conclude 4x, 5x. But there is another way which logicians uh, and mathematicians do all the time, and, uh, uh, but which looks a little bit obscured in, uh, in piano arithmetic, which is to reason with, uh, with a number given, given x or given n, you prove something about it without using induction, just prove it. And then by generalization, you'll get the universal statement. Because of arbitrariness of this particular object which you're discussing, talking about, you'll get the same universal or general proposition. The statement of consistency, a finite sequence of formulas is not derivation of a contradiction. After a straightforward Gödel coding becomes such Hilbertian finitary general proposition, a numeral n which is a Gödel number of S, is not a code of a derivation of a contradiction. And this is a hypothetical, it's a judgment depending on numeral. And they we're free to reason, to give an N without assuming any specific properties of N. You provide the reasoning which shows that N is consistent and you're done. And that, that's what we'll be doing. So piano arithmetic, just a brief reminder. Piano arithmetic is a formal first order theory containing constant zero functions, successor plus times, the usual recursive identities for these functions, numerals are terms, zero, zero prime, and so on. In addition, Piano has a standard induction principle for each formula, 5x, the formula ind, ind it's not Indiana, it's induction. Induction sub phi is postulated that 5, zero, as I said, and 4x, 5x implies 5x prime. The whole thing yields 4x, 5x. We assume that, well, since primitive recursive functions are representable in Piano, uh, for notational convenience, we can assume that terms for all primitive recursive functions are already present in the language of PA, along with the defining recursive conditions. So if a primitive recursive function F uh, has the um, F of M equals M in real life, as a, or the result of a computation, then Piano proved this fact. And uh, there, is a, uh, there is a corresponding primitive recursive terms handy, uh, handy ready for that, that f of n equals n. And consequently, any primitive recursive relation, if holds, uh, yields Piano proofs that, that the, 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 the corresponding uh, formal image of it. Uh, a pedantic listener may say, what, what does it mean? The, uh, the relation holds. 
Well, we're staying in the positions on, since there's a primitive recursive relation. It doesn't really matter what it means. It's in all models of arithmetic and in, uh, it's just the result of computational procedure. So it's model, this is model independent fact. Proof predicate, we're getting close. So let U column V, uh, excuse me for being very minimalistic in notations, but it really helps to remove all the unnecessary garbage from the slides. Be the standard primitive recursive proof predicate <coughs> in piano stating that u is a code, u is the first component, the first argument is a code of piano proof of a formula having code v. And the code we have good number or something of this kind. In particular, um, when we drop, we omit good number notations when safe, we can claim that p is a piano proof as a sequence of formulas, piano proof of phi, even only if P, the good number of it, is column phi, also good number of it. And this column stands for the um, primitive recursive uh, proof predicates in PN arithmetic. This is just kind of notational convention. Well, the first non-trivial observation, I was, I was glad, I was happy when I discovered this, but uh, just to, uh, when, when I, went back to study literature and discovered that, that some people, some smart people way back also noticed this and, uh, uh, and also even published this. But I don't found anyone who really made a good mileage out of it. But this is a mathematical proof of consistency should come first. So the way uh, the traditional approach Internalize consistency as a PA sentence, for example, as a consistency formula, Gödelian consistency formula, con PA, and prove the sentence in PA. This is a wrong way to prove, to establish consistency, because the inconsistent theory vacuously prove anything. So if you, if you prove this, then you, you're, you just, you're left with what? With nothing. So this is clear that uh, the way to prove the consistency of PA by means of PA would be to prove the consistency of PA in informal arithmetic, which is a real mathematical con contential or informal counterpart of PA. This is the theory from which the mathematical theory, uh, informal theory uh, from which PA is actually copied, uh, for which PA is a formal copy, and then formalizes proof in PA. And, uh, this is the reflected, and this reflected in the title of this slide, mathematical proof of consistency should come first. Well, and this approach, by the way, corresponds nicely to Hilbert's ideology uh, uh, of an informal trusted core uh, used to establish consistency of formal theories. That's what Hilbert, Hilbert's vision was. We have a trusted core, of course, informal, real math, such as mathematicians could, could really just agree upon this, this is something, something that, uh, and, and of course not formal, at least not formal from the beginning. And then we prove the consistency of big theories in the whole thing. And that, that's the vision which we discussed with Kolmogorov way back, uh, yes, to way back, unfortunately, yes. Uh, okay, it's innocent, an innocent example. Consider the arithmetical property of complete induction, which we all know since our childhood, I guess. Namely, if all x, the claim that for all y less than x, psi of y implies psi of x, then for all x, psi of x. You can read it again, but this is since everybody knows what it is. I just stop repeating this. And it, of course it has a standard, it's, a, it's, a, it's a every kid's chapter about induction and arithmetic and what different sorts of induction, they're all equivalent to each other. And in particular, this complete induction basically says that uh, the induction step here is not that the predecessor, uh, the phi of x should imply phi of x plus one, but the validity of psi in your case 
for all uh, for all numbers less than x imply the validity of it for x, then you're done. You have a general statement for x psi of x. And it's standard proof. Take an arbitrary psi, apply the usual induction to the artificially built 5x, which is actually a very easy construction. This for all y less than x, this is a bounded quantifier. Psi of y to get the complete induction statement corresponding to phi. Nothing to talk about. For a mathematician, it's just a very trivial step from the basic kindergarten mathematics. And of course, this proof uses no mathematical principles from outside piano arithmetic. It offers a uniform primitive recursive procedure. Now we're talking as logicians which given a formal of psi builds a derivation of ci of psi, those the, the statement corresponding to complete induction, instance of complete induction corresponding to psi in piano arithmetic. Because you give me a psi, I give you the proof, and here's the proof, just these two lines. It's one and a half actually. Very extremely easily formalizable. No questions about this. So totality of this procedure it's primitive recursive, it's just very efficient. And correctness of this procedure, which builds a proof derivation of ci psi from psi, are simple combinatorial observations, easily provable in piano. So complete induction is provable by means of PA, but complete induction cannot be represented by a single formula of PA, since PA is not finitely axiomatizable. This is less known, but still pretty, pretty easy observation. Yeah, it's another color of Gödel's theorem and plus some, some, other, some other later tricks, but basically it all started. It all ends up with the application of Gödel's theorem. All right. As we see, Piano can formalize mathematical proofs of properties not represented by a single formula. If you do not take this into account, then probability arguments risk losing their credibility indeed, if only properties presented by a single formula can be provable, then the property of complete induction is not provable by means of piano arithmetic. And I even put the small, the funny footnote here. Imagine logicians confessing to uh, their, uh, to mainstream mathematicians. Uh, and uh, for this, I always think about Misha Grom, of course, who is one of the, 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 the uh, Abel Price laureate and the, the brilliant mind of today's mathematics, who showed his, in, in many, numerous personal communications, shows his keen interest in what logic does and what it cannot do. So imagine logicians confessing to mainstream mathematicians that Gödel's theorem, Gödel's theorem yields, in addition to the probability of consistency, which we're all proud of, also, then probability of complete induction in the arithmetic. What would be the reaction of the thing? And I know the reaction of my fellow uh, pro theorists who say, then they would say that you logicians have no idea what you're doing. This is the expected reaction. So we really have to do something about it. It appears logicians have to revisit and extend the notion of a formal proof in PA to accommodate proven properties represented by schemes, not necessarily by single formulas. And this will change the perception of probability of consistency. We show that consistency of PA in its original formulation, no cheating here, it's just going back to the roots. In its original formulation is provable in arithmetic, the same way as complete induction is provable. Okay, building suspense, yes. So the road we take, another explanation, and also another approximation to what we're doing, and also another smoke screen removing, just being removed on this slide. The starting point of proving consistency is its original combinatorial definition. A finite sequence S of formulas is not a derivation of a contradiction. By Gödel's theorem, it's impossible to prove PA consistency by taking this, the, uh, the traditional road is the formalized consistency first and uh, then try to prove 
this uh, formally prove this formally in arithmetic. And this doesn't work. But we offer another route of proving PA consistency. And you'll, you'll see how this will resonate with, Gödel, with the Hil original Hilbert's question. We prove the consistency mathematically. And then we formalize this proof. It turns out that when you formalize this proof, you cannot really extract a single formal representing consistency property in there. It will be spread off the whole thing, but it will nevertheless be a mathematically solid, no questions asked, proof of consistency, completely formalizable in piano arithmetic. And since consistency is not represented by the con PA formula there, it's represented by some other way, the way it wants to be represented. We don't impose this particular restriction on it. G2 becomes irrelevant. And then both goals are achieved. We present a mathematical proof of PA consistency in its original Hilbertian form and verify that this proof is formalizable on PA. So, Hello to Encyclopedia Britannica. Okay. So mathematicians view, some people asking them the, the foundational question, what, what are we actually doing? So uh, it was before I made a clear distinction that what we're doing, we're proving things not in formal PA, we're proving things in informal PA, in the good mathematics way, such that Misha Gromov will understand it without going to formal. And then we use our, for, our formal scales to formalize it inside PA. So before this distinction, the proof is informal, but then followed by formalization, people were asking, how can you, what's going on there? You see what, what exactly you assume and what exactly, so maybe is there is a vicious circle that you're assuming piano and you assume that piano is consistent. No, there's nothing like this. So uh, it's small disclaimer here. Assume method logic within the standard University curriculum proves models, soundness, completeness. Uh, we're not pretending that we're not mathematicians, we are. Within this framework, we distinguish between informal math and arithmetic IA. I invented this, this, uh, this name here, which has the same postulates as piano itself. Uh, and uh, well, from one hand, and piano is a formal system on the other hand. Furthermore, from this perspective, PA is obviously consistency that has a standard model. But the task to find a proof of consistency of PA, formalizable in PA, becomes a mathematical problem. If nothing else, this is a typical problem of what can be done with limited tools. I can be doubling the cube using only in compass at a straight edge. It's a classical Greek time mathematical problem. And we show that one has an affirmative solution and that also answers the corresponding foundational question. Yes. A general plan of the consistency proof. The proof consists of PA goes by two consecutive steps as I, I'm, I'm beginning repeating myself. But for a good cause, I want to, you to, to understand that we're doing two-step things. Because even the best of my colleagues working proof theory and foundations, they, they had some, some of them, some of them immediately understood it. Like some boss, he had no questions about this. But some of them, I don't want to name names, say, well, they, they did not quite understand the difference that we're making two separate steps, which, of which is actually important. So first, it's a mathematical proof of consistency in its original form, a given finite sequence of formulas S it's not a PA derivation. There are no numbers there, there's no quantifiers. It's just the combinatorial statement with the parameters, finite sequence of formulas. And the, the comprehensive formalization of this one with every single detail is uh, uh, in PA. If, like in experienced people, and I hope that uh, some of the people in the audience uh, have this, by this sort of confidence, this is not actually necessary for experienced person. This is not actually necessary to do two once we have a good grasp of one and we understand informally that uh, uh, only principles of piano are used to do this. But for others, it's, it's our obligation probably and it's easy to do actually. 
to formalize the whole thing in piano and to show that only in the and to prove a general statement in such a way that uh, it shows that only principles of piano arithmetic and their and the good numbers are used in uh, in this proof now the proof itself it's uh, don't worry it's a good news a bad news about it the good news is that it's pretty short and especially but the bad news is of course that i'm i'm, I'm cutting some corners uh, but uh, which are really well well known facts in proof theory and i hope you, you can just open any book in arithmetic and you'll you'll get it on somewhere in the first chapters it's, it's just sounding it's like uh, Okay, we'll go. Uh, in the meta mathematics of first order arithmetic, there is a well known construction called partial truth definitions. I, I explain exactly what, what it is. And namely, for each n in numerals, so for each n 0, 1, and 2, we build in a primitive recursive way given n, the sigma n plus 1 formula. It's the truth for, uh, it's the truth definition for sigma n formulas, truth n, x, y. And I think that the, the most of the people who taught in their, in their academic life taught uh, um, more the university course of logic, they, uh, they encounter, they just come across this construction. So it's a truth, it's, a, it's, it's an arithmetical formula. And given n, you can, you can build it in a, there is a primitive recursive function which given and builds this formula of get a number. And which satisfies the natural properties of a truth predicate. Intuitively, it says that when phi is a sigma n formula and y is a se sequence encoding values of the parameters from y, phi is maybe an open formula, not necessarily closed formula, then uh, the truth n phi defines the truth value of phi on y. This is a hand wave, and, and that's the first mathematical proposition, proposition one. It's a well-known classics and proof theory of piano. And that's the proof, that's what I'm saying, is the proof of this proposition. You can go and uh, uh, there's the proof theory handbook in the yellow series, and there's a very nice introductory chapter by Sam Bass, and uh, it's there. And uh, the, there are nice books about piano arithmetic. It's always there because it's a classics there. Uh, so there are two items. Uh, usually there are more, but uh, all the rest you can derive from this easily. So for any sigma n formula, it's so-called Darsky condition. We all know that the truth definition for uni uni uniform truth definition, which works all formulas phi, is impossible. But the desiderata here would be the truth applied to the good number of phi is logically equivalent to phi itself. And this is a desiderato in the Tarski theorem. And the Tarski theorem says that it cannot be done uniformly for all n. But the remarkable construction is that for each specific n, you can do it. So you, if you have some way to limit the, uh, comple uh, the complexity of the sigma complexity of the class of formulas under consideration, then you, can, you have a nice truth definition which works exactly the way which it satisfies the Starsky condition. And this is point one in the proposition one. For any sigma n formula phi, and of course any simple formula, the, uh, the truth predicate out of, of phi is equivalent to phi, and it can be proven inside arithmetic. And in particular, uh, the falsum, which is the bottom, is not, is naturally, the negation of it is probable because by, by the thing, it's equivalent to falsum, and it's equivalent to falsum, then it's negation. It's negated, it's natural problem. So Piano proves that formula um, the contradiction doesn't satisfy truth. Uh, and you can easily guess what kind of invariant, which I promised to you, will be used there at this particular truth predicate. Of a given fixed complexity n will be the invariant for which helps us to prove uh, that falsum doesn't occur in a given PA derivation. So for, and then the second thing is for any axiom A of piano arithmetic of the depth less than N, given N, 
the truth, truth N of A uh, is just provable, which actually follows immediately from the Starsky condition, because uh, for if A's, uh, is A's death is limited by N, then by this thing, the truth is equivalent to A itself, and A is an axiom. Of course, it's probable in Piana. Note that all proofs in Proposition 1 are rigorous contentional arguments without any mathematical assumptions about PA. You just derive things in informal arithmetic in the, or you derive it in piano arithmetic, but it's not just a derivation. It's a, con, it's a specific derivation. If you look at the proof of this Proposition 1, it takes three pages of reasoning and it just the, the rather, rather routine constructions of how we code uh, limited quantifiers. Uh, in, um, the bound, sorry, the bounded quantifiers to keep the, everything primitive recursive, and that's it. Yeah, so the formal language of piano is used here just for bookkeeping. So this proposition one is provable in piano arithmetic, and it is provable in informal arithmetic as well. And now the proof of consistency itself. You can immediately, you can, you can even guess what's going to happen. Given a finite piano derivation S, we first calculate N such that the four, all formulas from S have the depth less or equal than N. So we put the upper bound to all formulas which we will be considering there. No cut-elimination needed, nothing is needed. We just check all the formulas from S and uh, it's a bounded quantifier and uh, uh, we, we just find this N uh, and we invoke the truth predicate of the complexity N. And then by induction up to length A, another bounded quantifier, we check that for any formula phi in S with parameters Y, the property, uh, they're all true. And uh, this is an immediate color of proposition one since each axiom from S satisfies true, so it's true. And each rule of inference respects true as well. So TN, the partial truth definition of the complexity N, which is primitively recursively calculated from S serves as invariant for formulas from S. And by proposition one, false doesn't satisfy true. So it's false, hence it's not an S. This is exactly how, uh, there is a very nice lemma in the proof complexity that induction up to sigma n plus one is capable of proving consistency in the usual Gidelian sense of uh, um, uh, I sigma N. And that's how it works. I just spelled it out in a nice human way. But uh, there is nothing new in this construction except that you have to, keep to, to, to look, to, to recognize that it's doing what we uh, want it to do. So this is a rigorous mathematical proof. That's why I'm really, uh, I have no, uh, I, I didn't have any objections from from all these the, the technical claims. People say, well, there's nothing really new in here except that we didn't know that this works this way. Uh, but uh, so the question whether it's primitive recursive and uh, some boss notice, oh, well, if you look at, if you look at the, what, uh, what Pavel Pudle did, then uh, we, can, we can find the proof. Uh, we can do it all in, in polynomial with a polynomial complexity. We don't need the whole class of primitive recursive things. We'll, we'll discuss it later. So this is a rigorous mathematical proof of consistency of piano. Furthermore, this proof uses only principles of piano and or uh, good hoarding of piano axioms in piano. This proof is natural, um, uh, is natural step by step formalizable in piano. We, in practice, we, uh, the proof theorists see that all this reasoning is just inside piano, of course. No sets, no standard models, no inductions up to epsilon zero, no functionals of finite type, nothing. It's just piano, simple and very simple combinatorics. And the highlight of the whole thing is that, well, bounded quantifiers yield primitive recursive conditions. The specifics of formalization. Here's a description of a primitive recursive function S of X selector connecting numeral M with the PA proof, uh, connecting the numeral M with the PA proof S of M of not M column 
Folsom, which is the consistent statement about uh, the derivation, uh, piano derivation M. Given M, the given number of piano derivation S, we, we first calculate M such that all formulas from S are just repeating, sorry, but I'm just repeating the steps of the algorithm from the previous slides, so depth and a less oracle and M. All quantifiers using this description of this procedure are now bounded by given primitive recursive functions of M. For any form of phi in S starting with axioms by induction on the length of S, I'm just there's a checker, the checker inside saying that that's what we're doing, we're still living inside piano. We build the piano proof of the, the truth. And this is just by formalizing, uh, or it's just looking at the, uh, the proof of uh, proposition number one. Since by proposition one, piano proves not uh, that bottom is false, we construct a proof that false is not in us. By this description, S of X is primitive recursive and piano naturally proves that for all X, S of X is a proof of not X column falso. And this is a nice trick. So far, we, what we did here, we proved things with a given numeral. We proved the thing but for numeral and then we use the formalization thesis to, which is which works like a church thesis here, to claim that the corresponding universal proposition is also probable in piano arithmetic, and this is an innocent step. It's just the cutting, uh, the cutting crap a little bit because we can we can build we can build this proof inside arithmetic directly, but we can we can shortcut. It's like you describe the algorithm by hand waving and saying by church thesis there is a program. That's what we're doing here, uh, but it's just for saving our, your, our attention and time. We can, uh, like with a computational, uh, with a computational example, uh, if there is a dis info description of the algorithm, you can build the Turing machine which does this. It's the same here. There's a description of a proof, and it's quite clear that it's the proof is inside piano, and you can repeat this proof by uh, writing ten. 10 pages of tedious text and you'll get the whole thing. But for proof theories, it's immediate. So once again, the piano proof of two is a formal certification that a given earlier conceptual proof of piano consistency uses only tools from piano. But after all this hand waving, I hope that you're at least ready to listen what's going on further. So what's just happened? Let's just uh, inhale breathe for a while. We have just offered the rigorous mathematical proof of Hilbert's consistency of piano in its original combinatorial format. No piano derivation S contains a contradiction. Specifically, given derivation S, we build an invariant arithmetical formula with the truth predicate for N, where N depends on S, such that all formulas from S satisfy this invariant, and the contradiction doesn't satisfy this invariant. We observe that every single step of Y is justified uh, by piano axioms at the time. We, rep we represent one in a finitary way by a computable function from S to a piano proof of consistency of S with all relevant properties provable in piano arithmetic. And uh, we conclude that after all this labor, uh, then one this proof may be regarded as desired proof of Hilbert consistency of piano arithmetic by means of piano arithmetic, at least by means formalizable in piano arithmetic. Again, hand wave to Encyclopedia Britannica. How far can we go with this proving consistency? You know, when, when you happen to come through, you, you see the big hole or in a, in the fence, and then you you you, be, you be, begin immediately trying to see whether it can be extended and what what kind of mileage can we get here? Maybe we'll get the whole Hilbert program out of there, because it's a healthy idea. Just don't stick to the specific formal format. You have to do it directly at combinatorial. But uh, not exact, not not the case, but still uh, interesting. So. Um, a little bit of proof theory. Let x column 
sub t of phi be a shorthand for a proof predicate theory t. X is a code of a proof of formal phi and t. And box is an existential quantifier. There exists x. Uh, and con t is in these notations, just not box t falso. As a byproduct of our consistency proof, we can derive in piano the constructive consistency formula. I can, uh, I can show it's, it's, it's actually easy. We show that for all x, there is a proof of <clears throat> uh, in t that x is not a proof of false. Actually, we prove it if you, if you go back and what we did, we prove it even with a witness here. It's not just an existential quantifier, but there is a witness, the primitive recursive terms, which realizes this correspondence. But here, we just relax it to the uh, box, which is a hidden existential quantifier. So it's a weaker formula. It's the, um, uh, in particular, we prove this one is constructive consistency formula, which, by the way, was observed by uh, 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 but Pfeiffer want to be provable back in 1960. Uh, as it was noticed by Kurahashi and Sinclair, independently, basically hours after the first version of this my uh, note was uh, published in archive, I, I, got, I got two email messages, 22 hours and 26 hours after the, the posting. And not the counts of the, you know, the time difference between the mid uh, Midwest which is Sinclair and Hura in Japan, which is Tashi Hurakashi. Pian does it prove second T for any T which is greater than piano plus consists piano. And this shows that though piano proves consistency of PA, as we just showed, piano cannot prove consistency of the next step after it. Piano plus con PA by the given method without further modifications. I see further modifications and uh, we, we still there are a lot of things to do behind this gate, uh, but uh, without modification, that's that's what I'm claiming. We can we can prove consistency of something which we assumed, contrary to the uh, the, the the foundational course expectations. But we uh, this kind of self verification is possible, but we cannot. With this particular method, we cannot step further, but at least now the, uh, the hunting season is over. And I hope that people will step in and begin thinking sharply about what's going on there. Now, uh, this is the, 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 the section number three, which is the, the relaxed discussion with logicians, fellow logicians, of how can we understand and comprehend what happened here from the log logician's or logical point of view. How does it fit into the uh, known body of, uh, of mathematics and logic? Um, I start with an abstract example, but which actually uh, shows a lot. Imagine that rationals, there are some, some small Buddhist monastery, or rationals are represented by finite decimal expansions only. There are affinities by their, uh, by their, um, by their religion, but uh, the way they, <coughs> so they look at numbers only, they're finally presented, the way they're presented is, is decimal approximations. So the final decimal expansions. Then division is impossible because we cannot divide y by three. Because there is a nice theorem which was kept secret for 300 years, maybe 500 years, but then uh, because it's too damaging for the field, but which says that uh, we cannot divide one by three. Exactly, we have to, uh, to settle for a certain approximation, which is not according to, which is not good for mathematics, not sufficient, not sufficient. However, we represent rationals in a finite way as fractions, n dash well, uh, the crossbar divided by M, where divided by is a fixed code for the division algorithm and M and then are integer inputs. It's a fraction representation. And this representation of rationals is as good as the decimal expansions because you can calculate, given a fraction, you can calculate routinely any decimal expansion of the whole thing. 
And it makes division possible for, uh, since the result of dividing y by 3 is represented by 1 uh, divided by 3, which was impossible. So we just overruled, we just overruled, we just step over the uh, impossibility theorem of this small set. Uh, working with rationals is finite, this small expansion. Both representations are finite, remember, but one is more which is more it's smarter than the other. Something like this happening here. We introduce new finite representation of mathematical proofs as PA objects. Under old notational conventions, some of those new proofs were simply left off the scope of formal proof theory, which is okay for nice proof theory, but it uh, will lose the connection with real mathematics. In particular, as I mentioned, we lose even the complete induction proof, which is a bizarre. Okay, now this is a little this is small math, but also just uh, an easy easy ride for a logician. So we mind the difference between numerals and natural numbers. Numerals are PA terms, and natural numbers are abstract objects satisfying axioms of PA, depending on the model. So let 5x be an arithmetical form of the free variable x. To express a general proposition about 5x, we can quantify over natural numbers for all x, 5x. That's the usual way of doing things. That's how we teach our students to, to, do, to build universal statements. On the other hand, 5x can be viewed as a scheme. We introduce notation first. It's a, it's a, it's a brackets, phi, phi in brackets, curve in, yes representing its instances. Uh, well, this is informal reading, but uh, the way we handle it will be represented, uh, will, will reflect this reading. In 4x, 5x, 4x refers to all elements of a given model, both standard, non-standard, and the parameter n and phi naturally ranges over numerals, and this will be reflected in the notion of approval scheme. We'll handle it a little bit differently than the formal 4x. So it's a new object schema, but it's in the constructed from uh, it's the same bricks, but a little bit different arrangement. The notion of a scheme can be naturally extended to formulas with no numerical parameter. For example, strong induction principle may be regarded as a scheme. Everybody knew it's an induction scheme with a formal parameter psi, but the way to handle it is totally the same. Schemes are well known in arithmetic, induction scheme, strong induction, reflection, signal completeness usually formulated as a scheme, positive introspection, negative introspection, although in general theory of proven schemes have not, no, no general theory been developed. The small trick is here that if you view in scheme as just uh, each, each instance of it that's probable in piano is actually not instructive. It's too coarse, it just doesn't work. So this is a principle bifurcation point, bifurcation point, which has been overlooked. The traditional rule, the consistency is represented by the formula cone PA, call X, X is not a proof of falsum, and by G2, cone PA is not probable in PA. The alternative route, not yet taken, that's the one which we already took uh, in this lecture, Hilbert's consistency property is represented by scheme. If you ask me what new I'm introducing in the whole analysis, my short answer is one sentence. Of course, I can give you 15 items, but the short, the real answer is, I suggest looking at consistency as viewing consistency as a scheme, not as a formula. And I have Hilbert behind me because he never thought that consistency will be a formula. He gave you as a general statement with, num with a, a, a numerical yes, no, a parameter, but it's not a universal formula. And by the way, uh, Gergel himself did not introduce it as a, uh, as a consistency formalization in the first place. If you remember the history, uh, this consistency formula appeared in the proof of the first incompleteness the theorem as a, just a fixed point of something. And only later, uh, von Neumann and Gertl himself noticed that this thing uh, can be, uh, this fixed point can be interpreted as an uh, internalized consistency. 
but it was not intentional uh, to connect it with the Hilbert program. Anyway, so that's an alternative root not taken. Not taken Hilbert's consistent properties are written by a scheme, which we suggest calling con SPA, and which we will treat as representing the set of hormones. Again, uh, this is uh, all this small theory of proven schemes. It is, it is the derivative of the original proof of consistency, which we already presented. And the proof whether our proof doesn't depend on what we're doing now. What we're doing now, it's a providing a general, a little bit more general environment, a general picture, uh, it's the context in which we're working. But the question of whether the consistency proof as presented is all right, is not uh, asked, we're not depending on the things but it's just an explanation of what's going on there for logicians. Again, the proof of schemes, schemes. So 5x is an arithmetical formula, and the proof of a scheme uh, is a pair S and P, where S is a primitive recursive selector terms, selector term, and P, uh, it's just a primitive recursive term, a primitive recursive function, which is presented as a term, natural term, and P is a piano proof that for all x, S of x, yields is a proof of 5x. So this is a general presentation of what we did for consistency. We are building a selector and the selector S works for the whole schema. It's the one uniform thing called selector. And we have a universal proof with the with a very strong internal universal quantifier for all x, s of x is a proof of 5 of x. So that selector, given x selector returns a proof of the instance corresponding to x, s of x. The scheme is provable in piano if it has a proof, this pair, and it's strongly provable if piano just proves the universal statement of it. And it's weakly provable in piano. If piano proves 5n pointwise for each specific numeral n, we have a proof of piano in there. So there is a provable, that's this definition, strongly provable is the usual uh, proof of universal statement. And the weakly provable, it's the usual the, the proof of instance there. And similar approach works for schemes with non-numerical parameters, as we already just discussed in, uh, for the case of strong induction. Um, usual things, strongly provable yields provable. It's a little bit of work here, but for those who work in formal proofs, and especially after years working in, uh, in, in logic of proofs and uh, BHK semantics, it's, it looks like it's just a piece of cake. Suppose Q is a proof of all x that's strongly provable, and we want, uh, we want to build this lecture there. If you have if you have a uni, if you have a uniform proof for all x f of x, of course we can build the selector. The selector is just uh, you take the general proof of uh, thing and just instantiate it for all x, and you can you can e easily do it inside whatever formal theory is, and you just build the selector right away. Provable is weakly provable. It's a little bit more tricky. It's a little bit tricky foundation. Mathematically, it's it's easy too but we have to distinguish what we're actually, we have to understand exactly what we're doing here. So probable yields weakly probable. It means that we have a proof, uh, probable with the selector. So we have P is a proof that for all X, S of X is a proof of five of X. Then given N, of course, we can get that P is a proof in piano. Then piano proves, since it proves the whole thing for you, the universal quantifier, it, it proves each of instance corresponding to the numeral N, of course. Now, we, uh, we piano proves it, but how can we claim that this thing actually holds? It requires certain validity assumption about piano. But validity assumption about piano, it looks like we have to look outside piano to get, to get our help. It says that it holds because it's proven in piano and everything proven in piano is true, and hence it holds. This thing doesn't work, of course. 
because what is what it means true, true in Pian, true in true in arithmetic. However, this is a simple statement because it's a primitive recursive things, and the problem piano for these things. Uh, here's a formal reasoning. Suppose that S of n doesn't prove phi of n in real life. In real life, it means it's a, it's a, it's a computational fact. It's a primitive recursive fact, and so. Uh, there's, a, there's a certain computation behind. And imagine this computation converges and showing not zero or something. It doesn't work. It doesn't hold. By completeness of piano with respect to free recursive conditions, we should have that piano proves its negation. So along with proving S of n column phi of n, piano should prove not S of n column phi of n. And hence piano proves falsum, which is shown earlier to be impossible. So we have an independent proof that piano is consistent. And therefore, S N is a PI derivation. So piano proves phi of n. So the fact that provable yields weakly provable actually relies on our proof of consistency of piano. If, of course, if you want this fat implication to be provable inside piano. If you don't care about our meta theory, then it, uh, it can be done in a cheap way. Uh, a little bit tricky as usual. Non probability is uh, involves uh, involves a little bit more mathematics. One is easier. It's probable doesn't mean strongly probable. So it means that if it's pro probable with with the selector function, it doesn't mean that it's probable with the universal quantifier. Well, just consider the uh, the PA consistency scheme, not X column false on This is a consistency scheme, standard consistency. As we have shown, it's probable in piano as a scheme, building selector function from the proof of consistency. On the other hand, by, by G2, piano doesn't prove the thing, the universal thing. Hence, the thing is not strongly probable in piano. And this is a difference between, this is a Gedalian formula, uh, the Gödel consistency formula, and this is our scheme. The Gödel formula is not probable, our scheme is probable in a sense. Really. Now, weakly probable doesn't yield probable. And this is something which people, the Arya guard, the last defenses of skeptics, uh, probably the, uh, the earlier this year, they kept asking questions that, well, maybe any pi one, true pi one sentence is probable as a scheme because you can build selector and just do the whole thing. The answer is no, of course not. And this is a nice example. And the, probably the simplest is we consider the scheme not X box falsum. It basically says that it's consistent to add non-consistency in the Gidelian sense of the formula. But this is a formal representation. It basically says that piano plus not consist piano is consistent. And uh, actually, we had this, I had this observation about a year ago that it's not constructively provable, but uh, here's the formal. Uh, the formal answer, this scheme is weakly provable since not n box falsum is true for each n. Why is this true? Because box falsum is false. And uh, we know that no false formulas can be proven in piano arithmetic. We know from high reasons. So not so n column box falsum is always false, and not l column falsum is always true. And since it's true, it's provable in piano arithmetic because all true sigma uh, primitive recursive sentences are provable in piano. But this shows the difference. That's what exactly. So we got it's it's a moment when we justify that this thing is provable. We went up above the piano arithmetic to do this is a true pure sentence now suppose that but just we claim that the thing is not scheme is not provable because there's no selector function that does the job we can see that suppose there is a selection function then we can do it the, 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 we can replace the selector with a, with a box which is existential quantifier that the thing is also provable and we claim that this would be, uh, in this case, if this were provable, then 
double box Folsom plus box Folsom, which is not the case because the box is the usual probability predicate. Uh, it's, it's a simple fact from, from the 70s, I guess. That's the, from early, age, early years of probability logic. We all know the thing is not provable. Uh, but uh, so the reduction of this thing, or uh, the derivation of the thing from this one. We reason PA, we assume box falls on, we add this box falls on there. And by strong form of sigma one completeness, we can uh, we can build box uh, in front of X in here because it's a it's a sigma actual primitive recursive condition, and we should have there exists X there, and for phi we get box false. So if we add suppose P on approve this one, then if we add box double box false to piano, we'll be able to prove box false from there, and and then. This application is probable, but this application is not probable. Well, by log theorem, for example, because by log theorem, the thing is probable only when uh, box falsum is probable and box falsum is not probable. We all know. Okay, now the hand waving and discussion and really enjoying life after and looking around what is the world, uh, how the world has changed. And I hope it's not like pandemic, it, uh, pandemic, it's changed the world, so the better. So proving a formula is a special case of proving a scheme. In formal arithmetic IA proves that proofs of schemes in piano are consistent. So we do not certify uh, prove the, the, these new proofs by schemes. They do not certify schemes containing zero equals one. And this was a nice question raised by Hartree Field, who asked, okay, we extended, we, we, we incorporated new proofs in piano. How can we be sure that this extended piano, fat pianos remain consistent? And we have to be able to prove it with the same way. And the answer is yes. And this, this follows from proposition three. And uh, uh, suppose Folsom is provable as a scheme by proposition three, it's derivable in piano as a formula, which is shown that in uh, IA, oh, it's a wrong font, not to be the case. Proving scheme doesn't add new theorems, but rather presents provable formulas and group schemes. Formulas from a scheme can be concurrently certified by one uh, finite proof of a scheme. Another analogy which I see is quantum computations. You compute the same things, but there's a huge embedded concurrency. So you consume, you, 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 you compute much faster. And there, in the same finite way, by using a more progressive way of presenting proofs, and we can handle it the same way as the usual proofs. We can compactify certain groups of proofs, which are intuitively proving the same thing one group and consider it as a one proof and indeed prove this new presentation in piano the way it's expected the the uh, the, the general mathematician expect formal logic to work at least we have to be able to formalize what they do in their own in everyday mathematics so Neither strong nor weak probability of schemes matches here. We consist the program format. By, by obvious reason, we argue that probability of schemes is a better fit here. Conceptually, proofs of schemes represent the overall case of a class of valid PA reasoning which induction instance involved are not bounded by some finite fragment of PA. This reason has been de facto used in informal arithmetic when proving strong induction. I'm just repeating myself. And the basic properties of proofs uh, of schemes. Proofs of schemes are finite syntactic objects. The proof predicate P is proof of scheme is decidable. And that's what uh, proof theories wanted me. Give me the, the notion of a proof of a scheme, okay? And we want it to be decidable. Of course, it is decidable. And the set of provable schemes is recursively numberable. It's what you expect from, from proofs, the usual way. 
more subtle this. If you have energy and for those who want some rest, I don't know myself, I, I take my Pellegrino. Thank you. So uh, uh, for those who have energy left, and uh, uh, this is, a, which you recognize as a Rosser trick, but uh, it shows that I really just tried, I walk on this, uh, I knew what I knew here about a year and a half ago, but I walked this year and a half to, to, to explore the surrounding, the context, and to clean everything, to anticipate the question and to self, you know, like in, in, uh, in codes, if you invent the code, you're, it's a matter of honor for you to break this code. You are the one who leads the quest to break this code. And that's what I have been doing for the whole thing. Trust me, I did this uh, with the help of uh, my critics and friends whom I all, and uh, not, very, not very friendly critics by whom, whom I all love very much because of their, in particular, at least for this contribution. So this is, this, this is, a, this is a nice, nice ex, uh, excurs. Uh, we call it the Rosser trick. Consider, we consider the scheme, uh, the same consistency scheme, not X uh, Folsom, which is the, the consistency in T scheme, is a scheme. And uh, we build a very specific proof of this scheme. We define it P PR selector function, uh, V, it should be probably R. Uh, I change it to R because of Rosser, because that's the trick which Rosser used in his proof predicate, actually. Given X, I'm describing V of X. Check whether X is a proof of Folsom and T. If yes, then V of X is an input be a simple derivation of not x column t Folsom from Folsom because from Folsom you can in two steps derive anything you wish. That's, this will be the official outcome of v of x if x is a proof of Folsom. And this is by the way the primitive recursive test. If no, then use probable sigma 1 completeness and put v of x to be a constructive derivation of not x Falsum in T. Let also P be an obvious the proof of it. So if you look at how this bifurcation here, this is a test there. For X, V of X is a proof that not X call, uh, X is not a proof of Falsum. But if you analyze it as a proof, as a mathematical proof that what it does, it checks whether Falsum is probable. If probable, it gives you the fake proof of not x false, the fake proof of consistency. And if it's not a proof of false, it gives you the real proof of consistency. But it does not recognize, it does not really distinguish which goes in. So it shows that there is always something which is a proof of the thing. To question whether VP is a legitimate proof of a scheme. And the second question is, when T is piano, whether well, this proof, which is the proof of, well, the answer to this one is yes. It's a legitimate proof of a scheme because you prove that's what, we have, what is required for the scheme. Whether well, this proof of a scheme, the consistency of the scheme, is a proof of PA consistency of piano. The answer is, the answer to B is no. This is a proof of a scheme, but it is not a proof of consistency. It is a proof of consistency scheme, but it's not a proof of consistency. And when you recognize it, well, it's a good example, which gives you whenever you have a doubt, go to this example, it cleans up the mind immediately. It shows what's going on there. And since a consistency proof of piano and piano, uh, uh, remember that we want, when you want to prove the consistency of piano and piano, first of all, it should be a mathematical proof of piano consistency in informal piano, in IA. And this question should be understood as whether V of N as a, as a mathematical argument, the selector, proves that piano derivation N doesn't contain falsehood. The answer is no, obviously negative. V of N only tells that if N contains falsehood, then you can still be able to offer a fake proof of consistency. And this is not a consistency proof. It's the way around it. 
it's uh, that's what I call the roster tree. If you if you take the consistency based on the roster proof predicate, that you can easily prove the consistency of, based on this predicate by this particular trick. You say that I don't know whether it's consistent or not, but if it's inconsistent, they still give you something which you will not recognize as an, as not a proof of that. So traditional proof theory should not feel disappointed not to see a clean formal criterion what counts as a consistency proof, even though there is a consistency schema. After all, for decades, logicians have not had a clean formal criterion what counts as a consistency formula. There are plenty of them. And the, the most remarkable one is Rosser, the Rosser predicate. Basin. And, and logicians have been using their contentional judgments to roll out Rosser consistency formula. Among others, is hiding the consistency assumption into this very formulation. And so it's dodging the problem instead of solving it. Oh, look around other theories. The next obvious question in this direction of whether the consistency of ZF can be established by means of ZF. And it appears, I'm, I'm certain that, that the answer is yes. It appears that the known proof of reflexivity of ZF, ZF proof consistency of each of the finite legs and ties fragments within the same circle of ideas, yields a mathematical proof of consistency scheme for ZF formalizable and ZF. And I hope that somebody who has more uh, solid intuition in set theory than me, I, I, I can do it, but I, I would be glad if something else will step in and, and do, because they'll do not only the thing, they'll do the things around. Uh, so many people ask, what about some finitely axiomatized uh, versions of arithmetic? Uh, and uh, well, they can be handled this way, the same way. I'm waiting for, I'll wait for the questions if you ask this. What we're looking at actually is the paradigm shift in foundations. The, the, the old thing was self-verification of the sufficiently rich consistent system is impossible in principle. That's what the famous, the spell, the foundational spell tells us, which is disappointing. So you assume something and then you're, uh, you, you, you don't have tools to even so sort of verify yourself whether your assumptions are consistent or not. This is bizarre. So you assume something and it becomes immediately a matter of uh, theology, whether, uh, whether you, uh, it's not satisfactory. I understand, but what we do, we knew more, we suggest a new more intuitive and balanced paradigm, which for me sounds, as a human being, sounds more natural. Self-verification is possible, but you assume something, and if you assume is really distant, there are some reasonable way like piano or ZF or something. A distant collection of principles, it can formalize a mathematical proof of its consistency. Mathematics is good enough to show that what you assume is uh, consistent, but of course on the basis of your assumptions. So far, we cannot promise that we can make a leap, uh, leap of proof further from our assumptions, but at least we can self-verification as possible. And that's our foundational contribution. We only have to look a uh, uh, sharper way of further reaching consistency proofs. We still don't know what, to what extent Hilbert's program of proving consists of strongest <coughs> by means of a trusted core is possible. But now as Gödel said, Hilbert's program is very much alive and even more interesting than it initially was. And I really invite everybody to think about it. And with this crowd, uh, with the crowd thinking, I think we can find some wonders on this direction. And by the way, as a computer scientist, the, my part, which is computer scientist, also is very pleased to say that, uh, that we have an impact of foundations of verification. Uh, imagine that we want to verify the property for all x t of x equals zero. Of course, everything in verification can be reduced to this form for some computable, uh, total computable form, everything quote unquote, of course, by proving the six in piano arithmetic. And the traditional G2 framework, and especially it annoyed computer scientists as well, I talked to many of them. In addition to a formal proof of six in piano, one needs some consistency assumptions about PA to conclude that T of N requires zero for, uh, return zero for it. Since it has assumed that these additional assumptions could not be verified in piano, they, strictly speaking, left a certain foundational loophole. When you go to the, for, for big finding for billions, and you say that the program which is you verified is really possible for launching the nuclear war, 
then you really have to be uh, just 120% certain. And then you say, well, I show that you, your assumptions are really solid and uh, well, at least it's self-verifying. In our framework, Piano proves its consistency, hence additional meta assumptions could be dropped. I don't know how much it really improves our certainty about the system, but it certainly improves the CV, it certainly improves the, its appearance. It proves its appearance. We no longer want uh, assumptions which we know we cannot prove by Google theory. We look much better to the, the, the people who decide whether to give these billions or not to be. So proven six formally and Piano is certified as a self-sufficient verification method. And now certain aggregated account of the past discussion. It's really an easy ride. You can relax and just enjoy some Q&A small session. I think that four minutes will be enough for me to finish. Do we use second order features in your consistency proof? No. Though the contentional definition of consistency contains an informal quantifier or finite sequence of formulas, and as you said, we're not doing, we're, no, we, we're proving it given a numeral, so we don't actually need a quantifier, neither to represent it nor to prove it. Uh, the, do we assume the standard model hence consists of piano? No. Nothing in this thing assumes a standard model. I work uh, in the original, in, in the previous uh, version of this presentation, uh, th th there were about 10 slides concerning what happens in the standard model and uh, what, what, what went wrong with the consistent formula and how the scheme fixes it. But then first, it really uh, it made things much heavier. And second, it really annoyed my friends who worked in, for, for many years in, uh, in pro theory, believing that the consistent formula is one and only. And I don't want to really just disappoint them just too much, showing that it doesn't work nicely in standard model, in non-standard models. Okay, isn't it true that, uh, isn't any true pi one sentence for all x, psi of x, probable in piano is the scheme? No, scheme psi is a true, is weakly probable, uh, but not necessarily probable. In the, in the example is given above by a scheme not x box false. This an example shows it, of course, by far not. Aren't we just assuming the well-known infinitary omega rule? No, omega rule is too strong for our purposes because uh, we, it steps outside piano by claiming for all x, five x. With omega rule, what we would do, we prove the consistent formula, which we are not doing. Whereas we stay inside PA, we prove the premises speaking uh, literally speaking um, artistically, we prove the premises of omega rule in a unified finite way, but not the conclusion. Is the notion of consistency proof decidable? As discussed, not exactly. Proof of schemes are decidable, but we cannot decide whether a given proof of a scheme is a formalization of a consistency proof. Likewise, the classical G2 framework cannot decide whether a given formula F is an acceptable formalization of consistency property. In both cases, a contentional judgment is needed. And as we said, how different are our consistent proof and well-known proof of Rosser consistency? Rosser's definition of proof, though quite natural, is quite different from Hilbert's. And our approach of consistency deals with the original Hilbert notion of proof consistency, but not with Rosser. How does this differ from the well-known observation that Piano proves Zero is not a proof of false and one is not a proof of false and two of false one. The usual standard model argument of this observation spills beyond piano arithmetic. We prove this fact in piano in a finite way using primitive recursive selectors about which piano can prove sufficient amount of my basic properties. We just squeeze the whole thing, which was well known, inside piano in a totally finitistic, uh, in a finite way. And uh, this is, this, this is probably the most juicy for everyone. Is intuitive arithmetic IA, is, actually, is, it, is it actually stronger than the formal arithmetic piano? This is a question which pops up because what we did, we build the proof of consistency in IA. And then to argue that the, the proofs in piano should be modified a little bit to accommodate this proof. 
because uh, in the, that's, that's what we did, yes. Formal piano uh, has the same axioms as IA in formal arithmetic, and the difference is how we use them. Proofs in IA are a priori more flexible. As Gödel noticed, it is conceivable there exists finitely infinitary proofs which cannot be expressed in the formalism of the basic system. And this is a proof of scheme, is a nice example of this. For formal piano, we are using Hilbert's notion of proof, find derivation of iron, and this is probably sufficient for deriving, uh, uh, find derivations, uh, the usual proofs in piano are sufficient for deriving formals probable in IA through formalization principle. However, formal piano derivations are too weak to match IA reasoning, IA reasoning, which refer to regular but unbounded collections of induction axioms, confer the proof of induction from induction consistency. Overall, as hinted, it's hinted by Gödel, enjoys more freedom in proving than formal PA, and the, even PA with proof of schemes. Of course, it's a better approximation to informal arithmetic, but it's now I have a gut feeling that it's hardly the end of the story. There should be further extensions, but we really work to look harder and to find them and to be inspired by what mathematics actually does uh, with the, the arithmetical tools. And don't box ourselves inside the piano arithmetic a priori. And that's true. That's the thanks. And I'm ready for whatever. Larry? So we, we should, we should, uh... We should all th thank you for a really wonderful talk. Um, and um, you can applaud or, you know, uh, th thanks for such a nice talk. Um, it's 5.30 and, and usually we end around now, but I would like to take um, three or four questions. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question, you could um, type it in the chat or raise your hand here. I would look for something. Um, yep. So who is who's liking to ask a question? Uh, Surely somebody would like to ask one. No. You have you have anticipated all the interesting questions here. I have a question. I don't know if you can see me. Yes. You we can, can stop sharing. Yeah. You can stop sharing your screen if you'd like, and then. Okay. Uh, yep. Stop sharing. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, okay. Here you are. Okay, Sergey. thanks very much. A fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it very much. In my opinion, it's quite revolutionary. I, I have a question for you. Maybe it's obvious, but not obvious for me. Can this kind of proof be adapted to halting problem, to the halting problem, to find a way of proving halting problem? I understand. No, no at least the, not, not the way it is presented, but it's, it may be an inspiration to look around, but uh, the way it's the way it's laid out here, it's totally different. So that's, it doesn't help us to prove halting problem. Uh, well, it doesn't alter the answer to the halting problem. And uh, so the answer is no. I, I thought about it for a couple of days because of course people answer this, but you're a nice person. They said, oh, it's, the, it's the cheap stuff. We can probably just prove that the halting problem, uh, that, that the cross the machine holds. No, 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 guys, you don't. It doesn't. So at this moment when I thought about it, I was interested in, in, in um, personally, I was interested to show that it doesn't work, but it, it really didn't work. So uh, so I think that the answer is no, at least as far as I can judge, no. It, it probably takes some different ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Probably there are problems of, uh, there, there are problems of a different character. That's what I think. Because halting, uh, the, the halting, in the halting problem, it really doesn't stop. No matter where you consider it, it just doesn't stop. Unless you go to some non-standard models and infinite time Turing machines, all this, this kind of yeah. things. But it, but it, it really doesn't stop. But yeah. it's, uh, in reality, it is consistent. But whether we can do it with limited tools, it was a problem. And what we managed, we squeezed the proof into limited tools, which changed the outcome. Uh, yeah. the peer problem, but it doesn't change the matter of problem. It remained consistent. So that's my answer. Sorry. Uh -huh. I mean, just, just an observation because it made me dream like going from uh, Gödel's theorem to 
health improvement and to a new possible proof of P equals NEP? Uh, I wish we can do it, but it's, it, it, <laughs> this, is, this is an inspirational, it's a Milky Way road, yes. Yeah. I know this is, um, I, I have this, um, this is one of my favorite pianists in the world. He is Grigory Sokolov, so I'm sorry I'm doing the, I'm, I'm, this is a small uh -huh. thing. It's <laughs> irrelevant. Uh, and uh, we, we met several times. And uh, mm -hmm. I talked to him, and he's he's ex he's totally exquisite. So he's the best pianist now available. He's about my age, and he's Russian, living in Europe, and so we understand each other immediately. And mm -hmm. uh, I told him that thank you for what you're doing because you're doing you're producing such a perfect music. So it helps everyone in the world who trying to pursue the perfection in their own profession to continue doing this. And this is, Walter, my answer to you. If this will inspire other people to think of this connection, I would be extremely glad to see this. Yes. Okay, we, we should uh, go on. We have three more questions and then I, and then I would like to end our meeting. So we have um, Andre um, and then Jimmy and then uh, Elio. So um, Andre, take yeah, it away. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Sergei. This is something I didn't ask you earlier. Can, can you hear me, it's okay? It's actually about this last remark, about the uh, last question, whether intuitive arithmetic is stronger yes. or not, or, or can arithmetic. So if I understood your answer correctly, so there is a sense in which it is stronger, right? So, so if you say in piano proof, there is no scheme, and here we add the scheme. But in that case, it's actually I'm trying to how say to apply this remark to beginning, and it becomes a little bit not clear to me what yes. actually is meant by uh, be proved in piano arithmetic, right? Because the main point whether or not consistency of P is provable in P, right? Because your strategy was okay. Understood. We first prove it informally and then we formalize it just for checking that we don't apply any stronger principle, okay? Okay, but, uh, but in view of this last remark, if we still there is a sense that it's stronger, so probably we need to better understand what in means, right? The proof. Uh, it's, um, yeah, the piano has the same I have several answers, but probably I try to I try this one. Piano has the same principles as intuitive arithmetic, but the way the proofs in piano are defined really limit our use of the same principles. So if you look at the collection of principles involved, they are the same strength as informal arithmetic, but there are some restrictions of how we can use this, and those restrictions should be loosened up should be lifted or a little bit relaxed a little bit because they do not correspond to what mathematicians do in in formal arithmetic and so this 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 is the answer yeah. and, uh, but, but would be correct to say that what we modify it's actually what qualifies as a proof right so that's where yes uh, yes what qualified was as acceptable proof otherwise we have to the, our class of proof is too small. You cannot include third cases, which are obviously should be there. So when you claim that something is unprovable, then it's um, the credibility of the statement is quite limited because something is unprovable. So so far, your your class of proofs is too small. It's a baby proofs. It's what you say that you can you cannot baby prove it, but maybe you can prove it uh, with real stuff. Thank you. Okay. Um still going sort of quickly so Jimmy yes testing testing can you hear me yeah okay I don't see but I cannot hear you yes yeah, so my, my camera's off uh, I have two questions the first is there are proofs that I've read uh, from Scott Aronson and others including I believe Gregory Triton in which yes. second incompleteness theorem is derived from mm -hmm. the assumption of undecidability of the halting problem and yes. I'm curious whether uh, this then 
your uh, proof of the your paper then uh, suggests that we need to reconsider the derivability of incompleteness from undecidability? Uh, I think they are related. So the problem is since we're taking the different route, uh, we're not taking the route for G2. We're taking the route by directly proving things and directly formalizing things. So I can make this same talk by not mentioning Gödel theory at all. Gödel theorem is mentioned here just to provide a certain environment for better understanding, to, to, to meet people's uh, cultural expectations of what kind of things are involved in there. But uh, so the, the answer is this particular proof is totally independent of G2. And I don't think that the, the, the mathematically the things are related to charging observation. Okay, interesting. I'll think about that. Uh, the second, uh, regarding foundations, does this result have any implication for some of the work of Bavodsky, homotopy type theory, univalent foundations on providing a uh, machine yes. amenable foundation for mathematics? Andre, this is a question to Andre Rodin, who spent this year in Princeton yeah. under Wojewodzki. So that's, I, I talked to Wojewodzki several times, extendedly for several hours, but still we have much more qualified people. What do you think, Andre? Uh, no, first of all, uh, Wojewodzki himself, he tried to tackle this issue, but then there was this big critique, and I, I think he, he just tried to play with the idea that arithmetic could be inconsistent somehow. So, uh, uh, so at, no, at least his original uh, approach is understand him correctly, what is, uh, how say, rational and not mistake, is the idea that in some sense consistency is not so central. And um, I, uh, how I can interpret it actually uh, is that uh, in this uh, um, homotopy interpretation, right, uh, your theory is not uh, a set of uh, propositions, right? There are propositions that are higher homotopy type. So instead of consistency, you should think actually about stronger property, something having to do with uh, concurrence that you mentioned. Yes, and uh, and I don't know, it's, 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 it's very interesting, right? But, yes, but this, yes. Is, this is behind the fence, and so and, and I'm inviting you to look to, to step in and to look what kind of universe is there. Very interesting, very intriguing, thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, but for computer science, it's it's a it's a primary importance. The consistency is the, the it's their concern clearly. Yes. Okay. Maybe a question from uh, Eliola Rosa. Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, so first of all, congratulations for your musical taste. I think Sokolov is great pianist <laughs> as well. <laughs> it's it's always nice not to feel too 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 much alone in the universe. <laughs> Um, so my question was about this. So if, if I understood correctly, so it's, it's central the question on of where, whether whether these um, uh, proofs of scheme, like w w what is the kind of like uh, uh, power that these schemes like give. So I was wondering, I didn't understand if uh, this this sort of uh, this this way of understanding a scheme is already uh, embeddable in the logic of proofs, for example. Or, or if, or if, the, or there will be some some study in, in that. In that uh, respect. Yes, the, the thing, good question, and, and thank you for that. Uh, they're very much related ideologically, and I'm, uh, as, uh, from in the very beginning, when I have to, to kill a couple of minutes, I explained that the whole project mm -hmm. really just arose from uh, thinking about logic of proofs and what kind of information, what kind of insight it gives about the BHK problem and yeah. about the kind of um, proof manipulations and uh, uh, verifications, uh, corresponding verifications. So this th this way it works, but it's um, uh, it's amalgamated on the uh, on, on this uh, on, on this particular topic. But maybe uh, if there is a formal connection, uh, the logic of proofs itself is uh, and the basic installation is propositional. When you go when you go to yeah. 
Yes, this is what I was thinking exactly. Yeah. And uh, it's um, it's a it's a too powerful, not too true, but very powerful language. You can express a lot of things there, but there are so many uh, unexplored applications of the propositional level, for justification logic and for social, for social things. It's a it's a very general phenomenon because it's now uh, the can communicating the message that A is true is totally obsolete. You have to communicate the message that A is true by reason T, because without this, if you look at internet and you take it, everything on the first value, or you look at the TV and whatever speaking head gives you some, tells you something, of course you have to, to look at the, uh, the evidence. So this is, um, uh, so there are so many things to apply and to recast in logical applications and social, in social life that uh, first order, of course it's there, but uh, we're not, uh, the, it's underinvested into. But um, if there is a connection of LP uh, on the schematic, more schematic level, I don't know, probably yes, but it's such a fresh thing. Mm -hmm. It's uh, then uh, it's open to whatever it is, just to look at it and you with a fresh eye, you immediately find something which is foundational and durable. Yes, yeah, okay. it was just, just, just a small reboot. So I was just thinking that this might be the way to investigate this. It seems like the natural way to investigate this um, in the logic of proofs, in an, in an extension of logical proofs. Who, who did such, you mentioned the name or two? No, 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 no. I was thinking, I was just thinking that this, this seems like. Yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I know. I, uh, yeah. I just stopped there. And, but, mm. So we, we have to um, thank you again and end, but I would like um, Professor Dunn, who, who um, is our senior logician here in Indiana, who has, has a remark to, to close our meeting, but I wanted to like to thank you, um, uh, Sergey, for, for a really wonderful time and um, taking all comers and uh, educating us about the, the importance of schemes today. So thanks so much. And good piano music. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, Mike, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll try to be quick. First, Sergey, I just wanted the opportunity to say hi to you and give Sally hi, my best regards to Elena and take some for yourself. Absolutely. But uh, I wanted to tell a story about a colleague we all had in common, you, me, and uh, Larry, uh, the late Raymond Smullyan. Yes. And he phoned me, as he used to do, uh, on a Sunday, and uh, he said, uh, Mike, who is the name of that logician who proved arithmetic consistent? And I paused and I thought, and I said, do you mean proved arithmetic consistent using only arithmetic? He said, yes, yes, of course. I said, but you know, Girdle showed that was impossible. And he said, no, no, no. Didn't you read the Sunday Times? It was on the front page. <laughs> and I said, well, I thought I did, but maybe not all of it. I would have seen that. And then he said, uh, what day is today? I said, April 1st. Uh, said, April Fools. April Fools, good, good. So but I just no, wanted to remark that I'm he sorry. couldn't have told that joke after your paper. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad that I did something for him. And this, we, we, we arranged this, his 19th birthday conference there, here. And yes, then. that was wonderful. Anyway, that's, I know Larry needs to run, but really great to see you and a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. It's just, and, and very best love to your wife, sure. You know. Okay. And Elena. Yeah, Lena. She, she, she's still there. She, she's too shy to show her face, but... Oh, of you, course. Yeah. She, she's down see, actually at another Zoom meeting. <laughs> on, on, on the stairs of the Moscow University. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, oh, I see. I understand. Okay. Anyway, goodbye, everybody. Great to see everybody. Well, yeah, thanks, thanks to everybody for coming. Thank well, you. We'll try to post this slide Thank here. You. Thank you. Great yeah. inspiration. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much for a great talk. Yeah. Thanks. See you. Thank <laughs> you.